cow, sit it down. I don't want y'all to get it confused. I rip it down. Like I ain't got nothing to do. What's up? My man Rick Lopez. What's going on? And Rick, R-I-K. Nephew, what's going on? My nigga. Jay Lee. Big Josh. What's good with you, baby? Oh, we were waiting on the guests real quick. If so, but we just gonna get this thing started at 11 o'clock for show for show, though. You already know what it is. Hold on real quick. Fuck up the game. Your shit even got levers. Six. I'm in LA right now, brother. All right, well, I'm waiting on my guests to come on in still, so let's go ahead and jump on it real quick, man. Let's go, let's jump into the uh, basketball real fast, man. Let's talk about it. There we are, Lakers, Lakers, Lakers. Okay, so here we are. The Lakers are in a situation right now where their season is really not the way that the season. What, hey, you know what? Honestly, the season's over right now, but we're over here dealing with the pandemic and everything like that. So now we get things started next week, and the state of the Lakers is looking pretty good. But actually, there's some weaknesses going on with the Lakers right now as well, too. As I keep saying to people, the person that's going to have to be the big, big player for us uh, moving forward here is going to be a guy by the name of Anthony Davis. Everybody wants to put it on LeBron, but LeBron's an old man who's already won his championships. Yes, he is great. He is one of the best players in the league, period, period, point blank. But the thing is, well, pretty much the best player in the league. But at the end of the day, though, it is a new day. And Anthony Davis is going to have to be big. He's going to have to be strong. He's going to have to be bigger than big. He's going to have to be really, 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 really good. And I think that this is going to lead the Lakers to a championship if they're able to go ahead and do things the correct way here. So my whole thing is like this. What people have to understand is if you can get the AD that you got back in the 2018 finals who single-handedly beat the Blazers by itself, the kid was going off. 41 a night, all that good stuff. And I'm telling you, if you can get that guy, then the Lakers should be able to cruise to the championship with LeBron. But my biggest hang-up with the Lakers right now is going to be the guard play. I'm going to be dead honest with you guys. The guard play of the Lakers is going to be something that's going to be very, very crucial. And I know that without Rondo being there, that's just not having your veteran. But not having Avery Bradley is huge because he's young. He plays good defense. He's a good player. He does what he has to do, and boom. And literally, what happens is with this is that you got a guy who's going to sit up there and he's really going to be able to do what he has to do and um, pretty much get things going on. And, you know, that's what Bradley's going to play defense. He's going to play offense. He's going to do it all. But the thing is with Rondo, he's old, he's brittle, and 
he just had to have an Avery Bradley. Avery Bradley set the tone defensive wise for the Lakers. Everybody kind of played off his his key a bit, and I feel like he kind of did like walk out on the team a little bit. I understand that he's a little scared about the uh, virus and everything like that, and he has a child that really couldn't travel because he has asthma, but nobody else has their kids at the um, bubble right now. And literally, your kids really can't even be with you at the bubble. So, like, seriously, I feel like there was just a lot of excuses coming from Avery Bradley, in a sense. And these are guys that I think that pretty much are part of the group of players that are like, I'd much rather have the year off. You know what I mean? I'd much rather be, be done with this because they pretty much ended basketball back in March and they literally have made baseball a half a season now. So we have to really go ahead and deal with these things and just move forward with that. But all in all, that's my two cents on the state of the Lakers right now. They got about a week to go before we are actually able to really assess things properly. But the Lakers do have a heavy haul playing the Clippers opening night. And I think that's going to wind up being one of those games where the Lakers are really going to have to step it up early. And they're early and often and make sure that, you know, they don't get too besides themselves. And you already know that the Clippers are going to be playing it like it's the NBA championship and everything. So the Lakers better have that game face on come next week. But we'll talk about the Lakers more this week. And, you know, pretty much that's the NBA. That's some NBA notes for you right there. But we're going to move on real quick. And let's talk about the Knicks and the Knicks. I know the Knicks. I don't you guys. I know you guys are thinking like, what the hell is he doing talking about the Knicks? The Knicks. Who do, who, what is this with the Knicks? Well, I'm going to tell you guys something. The Knicks, um, the Knicks right now are a team that's on the verge of being somewhat famous again, noticeable again. So I truly do feel like with them, it's going to be like, you know, they're going to have to really go ahead and just bite the bullet. And they're going to have to bring in Thibodeau, a defensive uh, coach, a coach that has a plan. But I truly do think that when you bring in Tim, when you bring in a coach like Coach Tibbs, you gonna have to make sure that this guy is gonna be a. Be, you gonna have to make sure you equip him with some really good players, some really strong players, some guys who aren't soft. You know what I mean? Guys who can take coaching, and it's gonna be another young group like it was the first time around uh, with Minnesota. But I think though, at, at the end of the day, this is gonna work because this is a major market, just like Chicago was a major market. For the NBA, Boston is a major market for the NBA, but Minnesota isn't. And New York is the pinnacle, and New York is Thibodeau's actual dream job as well, too. So he knows failing in New York means that's it. It's a wrap on him being a coach in the NBA, like a head coach in the NBA, if he doesn't make it in New York. And I think that he is a viable option. He's the best coach they would have since Van Gundy. So I'm saying, and he was a part of Van Gundy's staff too. So it makes total sense that Tibbs is the leader in the clubhouse to be the head coach of the New York Knicks. And I think that's exactly on the money. That's exactly right. And um, pretty much our guest will be here in 10 minutes. So it's all good. I'm, a, I'm gonna uh, wait for him. He's driving. I don't want to distract him while he's driving, but we'll have our guest here in a moment and everything like that forever. He's watching at live at the moment. So. Pretty much, you guys already know what it is, though, man. We rocking and rolling right now. Primetime Angles Live on the IG. But um, all in all, though, the good thing I got this text back from my guy real quick to see exactly what's going on. But we will have Burley Brooks in here with us um, in a moment uh, talking about... Um, we will have Burley in here talking about his... Um, talking about the... Um, well, just talking, just keep, just catching up with uh, one of the stars of Man Down uh, Promotions and everything like that, uh, the protege of Aero Spence and everything. You guys know that I've had a few interviews with him before. So, you know, and I gave him his first interview at Jerry's World um, after his weigh-in, and I gave him the interview afterwards as well, too. So, you know, me and him have a good relationship and everything like that, and that's a guy that I really root for. And, you know, he's a good guy, good friend and everything like that as well, too. So... You know, you guys be out on the lookout for Berla Brooks Havoc. But he'll be with us in a moment as um, we put this together. Um, so pretty much um, just waiting on him real quick. But most likely, though, even if even if we don't get catch him live with us while we're doing the show, 
I'm still would have to stop the show anyway because this is going to be something with Fanatics view as well too. But let me get back to the top at hand, Tim, Tim Thibodeau. You already know that if he becomes the coach of the Knicks, the Knicks should be instantly improved. And this is who he's going to have to pick to make sure that this occurs. LaMelo Ball. I'm telling you right now. Him on the Knicks just makes too much sense right now. It makes so much sense that it's probably not going to happen. Last year, it was all about Zion going to the Knicks and being the change of the Knicks and being the face of the Knicks and all that good stuff. We get to lottery night, and even Zion wanted to kind of shed a tear a little bit that he wasn't going to be headed to the Big Apple to New York City where it, the, the hype train would be really, really, really huge right now. He's being hyped, but if he was in New York City, it is different. They would have been having the bow ads. He would have had his place is all over the billboards, meeting big time uh, billionaires and things of that uh, nature. Help guys who help you invest in big things and things like that. So, you know, New York City is a bit different from going to New Orleans. You know, New Orleans, all you expect is some good eating. And some, you know, some 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 mediocre basketball at best. But he's been blessed that he was able to get a, t- a team that literally is made up of all top five picks, pretty much. So that works out for the um, Pelicans and their team that's going to wind up being in the um, their team that's going to wind up being in the. Um, you know, they're in the bubble, and they might wind up being in the playoffs as well, too. But we will see, and um, we'll see how things go from there. But what's up, Nut? What you call? But, um, man, it is what it is. But all in all, though, LaMelo Ball, I would say, has to be the next pick. It doesn't need to be the first pick in the draft. It just needs to be the guy that you're going to be um, – it just needs to be the guy that you're dealing with. Okay, that's that's what it needs to be. He needs to be the guy that you're selecting. Even if you have to trade your pick for him, you have to get him. LaMelo Ball to the Knicks, it makes way too much sense. So let's see how it goes. But all in all, though, that's it and that's all for the Knicks. And let's talk about how they sleeping on the Bucks right now. The Bucks are a team to me that are playing some, they're playing the best basketball right now. They have the best record in basketball right now. And they're still being overlooked at this moment because everybody is very enticed with the Battle of L.A. at this moment. Everybody loves LeBron. Everybody loves the uh, Kawhi. But at the end of the day, though, this really is the team that you have to beat. They have Giannis. They have great outside shooting from their from their big men and from their guards. And the one thing that they do do very well and ex- exceptional as well, too, they play great defense. A lot of people do not say that about the Bucs, but the Bucs have played great defense. They really got to where they're at right now because of playing defense. And they've actually blown out a lot of teams this year. Like, they've averaged at one week, I remember they beat everybody by 25 or better. So, this is a team that already has the MVP of the NBA rocking with them. Then they have another all-star in Middleton who's a very good player. And they actually got better since you know they were able since they lost uh uh brogdon you know i mean brogdon was the rookie of the year and it felt like that might be something of a fall off for this team but all in all what happened with the bucks is they got better defensively they still got air bledsoe they still doing big things and i just really do feel like this could be something that could work out well for the bucks with them being under the radar that the way that they are at this point point in time a lot of people are sleeping on the Bucks. They're not even picking them to win the East at this moment. But we all know that the Bucks have a lot of proving to do. And, you know, they're looking a lot like how Toronto looked for a few years. You got really great players, but you're not getting it done in the end. And this year, they have the advantage being in a bubble and then also being a first seed and being able to have the the uh, leverage to go ahead and just kind of relax, kind of chill a little bit. So, you know, we'll see how it goes, but it is what it is. It is what it is, man. So, pretty much at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that's where I'm seeing the Bucks at right now. And I think that a lot of us have to take the Bucks very seriously. And that 3-1 to one odds that they got going on them right now to win the championship, that is much better than the odds that they had on them a few months back when, you know, pretty much everybody was 
for had the foregone conclusion that it could possibly be the Bucks and the Lakers or the Bucks and the Clippers. So we all see how it goes. And that's gonna wrap up our NBA notes for right now for today. So tomorrow I'll have some more stuff in the NBA for you. But right now we're gonna go ahead and jump on over to baseball. We got baseball at the end of the week this week. Um, coming up on Thursday, and then we'll be able to start back having baseball at a at where we need to have baseball at on a daily basis, playing about 10 to 12, 14 games daily, and it's going to be fun. So let's start off first and talk about the NL, about the AL East. I was going to start with the NL, but we got to start with the AL. And up first, let's go ahead and talk about the Baltimore Orioles. The Baltimore Orioles are have over under uh, 21 wins this year. I got them going under 21 wins. Baltimore is going to be really bad. Baltimore might be able to might Baltimore to me wins a teenager worth of games, meaning 16, 17 games this season. I think that they're going to struggle mightily to start the year off and then they're going to struggle literally throughout the whole year and then they'll probably catch up at the end of the year when everybody's kind of, you know, kind of overlooking them and everything like that but I truly do think that the Orioles are going to be an absolute laughing stock this year I don't know I don't see them doing much of anything to be honest with you they don't really have anybody um this year they seriously they're they're still building a team over there they're still maybe about two three years away from being even credible in the MLB in my opinion and I know that they're doing this on purpose so they can build up with somewhat of a super team down the road because regardless of how people feel about the Astros people want to be the Astros at the same time too they built that team through the farm and they were able to make great trades because they have great farm players down there to get those really high-end players to move forward and actually be pretty good with you know so um, pretty much with that we got you know, Baltimore, you're under 21 wins in my book. You don't really have much. You you don't you didn't really have like an all star this year either, in my opinion. So they'll be decent. They'll be a team that will be able to help us out on days when we need a plus 300 and nobody sees it coming and they're at home. But other than that, I think that they're gonna be a team that's gonna actually just have a really really tough season, and I'm gonna stick by that. So. Once again, Baltimore Orioles, you are going under 21 games. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the Red Sox. The Red Sox are a team dealing with controversy. They had to fire their manager, um, who's not far removed from winning a World Series back in 2019. And this team lost two of their more critical players, Mookie Betts and David Price, were both traded to the Dodgers. But they were able to pick up some young prospects from the Dodgers as well too but those guys aren't going to be really factors for the Red Sox for another year or two so at this point right now I would say that this team would need to really be on their A game to be that honest with you they would really need to be on their A game to really good win over 30 games they have way too much controversy this year and I think that a slow start is inevitable for the Red Sox this year as well too Uh, they have a brand new leader Their motivation really isn't there, in my opinion. And I think that they'll fall up under 30 games or just hit 30 games right there evenly. But So I don't believe much in the Red Sox this season. I think controversy pretty much killed their season before it even started. So there it is with uh, the Red Sox. Now let's move on to the mighty, mighty Yankees. And the Yankees right now have one of the higher... um, over under win totals and that's going to be 37 i think the yankees are a 40 win team this year because we only got 60 games this year but 40 wins is like winning 100 games this year so i think a 40 win team is is for the yankees that's not tough to to fathom you know what i mean i think the yankees are going to be good enough to get that uh, go and get to where they need to get to and i think that they'll be fine to be that honest with you so um in all honesty, the Yankees over 37 wins, that should work out very well. I think this team wins 40 or better. They'll find themselves in a race, though, at the end of the year with the Tampa Bay Rays. And I'm going to talk about that once I go ahead and switch over to them in a moment. But the Yankees 
do have some smooth sailing ahead of them here in the East. There's only one team I see actually giving them some issues and actually having a chance to win this division. And we'll talk about that in a moment when I get to Tampa Bay. But right now, the Yankees, they still have Stanton. They still have Judge. They still have Paxton. They still have all the guys that, you know, they spent a lot of money on over the years and made a lot of deals for. So, man, I'm telling you right now, this will be something that we look at and say to ourselves, okay, Yankees should be right there in the playoff picture. If they don't make the playoffs, it's an absolute bust for them this year, to be that honest with you. Because I'm talking about the Yankees and Tampa Bay being two of the best teams in the American League, not just in the East. So, we're going to see how it goes. So, let's go ahead and see about those Rays. Now, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, boy, oh boy, this team is at 34 uh, wins over and under. I got them going well over 34 wins. They are a type of team that I feel like they'll be hot when the season starts. Uh, and they'll be a good dog for you as well, too. They're going to bring a lot of value to the table as well, too. So, Tampa Bay, over 34 wins. I think this will work. This will be something huge. And, I, hey, I'm with it. I'm, I'm all for it. I think that this will wind up being something that's a very, very big deal. So, let's see how it shakes out over 34 wins for Tampa Bay. As I said before, I feel like they will challenge the Yankees for the East. And they got a big, strong chance of winning the AL East as well, too, and having the best record in the American League. They have a very deep team quietly. They're under the radar squad. So I really do hope that people do understand that this team is going to be able to make sure, make themselves, you know, a little bit more relevant and everything like that. So it is what it is, man. Over here just looking at the news real quick. We got the Knicks. And, um, you know, we'll talk more about that as we go on this week because, you know, I'm not trying to stay, stay, I'm not trying to stick here around too long and take up too much of your time. So, you know what it is. But Tampa Bay, over 34 wins. I like this team coming into next season. I know that they still have Blake Snell, hell of a pitcher, and they still do have Charlie Morton as well, too. So this team, they have the pitching staff, which is probably the best pitching staff in the division. And they also have the... You know, young players that are very hungry to keep improving and keep being great players. So, you know, it is what it is. Tampa Bay, over 34 wins. They will challenge for the East title as well, too. All right, so we got the 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 new boys. That's the Blue Jays. You already know the Blue Jays are very popular because they have a whole bunch of old OG uh, possible Hall of Famers. Well, one's a Hall of Famer, but some of them... You know, you can argue and say that they should be in the Hall of Fame, but their sons play for this team. You got Dante Pachette's kid out there. You got Vlad Jr. out there as well, too. And these guys, they're having a ball playing with each other. They're the young Jays right now. And they're a team that they're so young, you really don't know where they're going to go to. But with the shortened season, they're they're still learn as and they're still learning the game somewhat. It's going to be really tough. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. And I really don't see them doing that well this season with the season being short. I think that they'll get off to a slow start. They'll heat up midseason, and then their end will be their downfall. I think that injuries will probably be uh, a thing that's going to hamper this team as well, too. They've really went ahead and committed themselves to the future now. After a few years of spending big money trying to win a World Series, they tried to duplicate what they did in 91 to 92, and they came up short. It's that simple with the uh, Blue Jays. So now you have a Blue Jays team. They're rebuilding. They're trying to put it together. They got a lot of good young talent there, and we'll see how it goes. But I got them going under 28 wins this year. So let's switch on to the NL. And up first is going to be the Atlanta Braves. And the Atlanta Braves are sitting here um, with 33 and a half uh, for the total over under. And I'm going to go ahead and rock with the over 33 and a half with the Braves. I think that this is going to work out and it's going to work out pretty well for us. I think that the uh, Braves will defend their title and do a damn good job of it. But that doesn't mean they're guaranteed the title because honestly, um, you know, I'm speaking from what I saw last season and the roster that they have intact and knowing that they have a pretty good pitching staff, but I know that the Braves are, can choke too. I know that the Braves can overlook things and, you know, lose seven games in a row. 
You know, and that's what type of division this is when you're dealing with the NL East as well, too. All these teams are suspect. And all of them have their, their ups and their downs. But the the Braves are the one with the minimal uh, minimal weaknesses. Um, so I got them going over 33 and a half games. I think it's going to be an absolute war to win the East this year. But still, I think that the the Braves are a sure bet to go over 33 and a half games. I think they're a 35, 36 game winner, to be honest with you. So I like the Braves at over 33 and a half. They did add Cole Hamill, so that's a good veteran to have there as well, too. So we'll see how it goes. But the Braves, I got them over 33 and a half. Now, let's move on and... This is the team that I really like to win the East this year, and that's going to be the Mets. I think the Mets have three of the best pitchers in the division when you bring in Thor, DeGrom, and Stroman. All those guys can pitch. All those guys are doing are, – are, we're, we're pitching some pretty damn good baseball at the end of the year last year as well too. And Stroman's really excited about playing in New York City as well too, playing in Queens. He's not too far from where he grew up at. And I think that the Mets are can be the miracle Mets this year in a shortened season. And the way that their field sets up and the way that game set up in New York, man, without a crowd this year, they could probably play some really good baseball without somebody trying to sit up there and throw uh, peanuts and beers at you all game. I'm just messing around. I know that in Queens they're a little bit more tamer than they are in the Bronx. So... Uh, you know, pretty much my thing is like this. Let's go ahead and uh, circle that over 32. I think that the uh, Mets will be right there. They look like they could be a 34, 35 game winner. And I truly do feel like this division will come down to the final week between the Mets and the Braves. And I really do like the Mets to edge them out. But I can't forget that the Braves do have the better roster. But the Mets, they just got the better tradition when it comes to winning in a shortened situation. And I think that this suits them very, very well. Now we move on and we got, now we got the low of the low. Now we got the Miami Marlins. This is a team that I truly, I know everybody's like, I don't know what pop smoking right now. But I think that these guys can actually go ahead and win over 24 and a half games. Come on, it's a half there. So that means that I feel like they can win 25 games this year. I think that this team is improving slowly and I think this is a good year for them to evaluate a lot of young players and with these young players playing on a shortened season if they can kind of click right away then maybe they can get off to a good little start and then reality sets in say the second third month of the season okay and then you know they go back to regular but I truly do think that this team could win 25 games this year. They're more than capable of doing it, and uh, that's why I got them circled for over 24 and a half. All right, we move on, and this is going to surprise some people, and I know he's going to be mad at me too. Philly, uh, Philly Pete, I know you're going to watch the show later on, man. I know you love your Phillies and everything like that, but the pitching is not there yet. I know that they got some pitches that they think are pretty good for the future, but everybody on that pitching staff is home, is is a uh, uh, they all give up a lot of runs. They all give up home runs, things of that nature. And I just really, truly feel like Phillies didn't have enough time to prepare and maybe bring in certain players that can enhance their team and make their team a bit better. This team was a team that definitely needs 160 games because they got out to a slow start last year. They got out to a slow start the year before. And I feel like they're going to get out to another slow start to start this season as well, too. And this is even with Bryce Harper as well, with the frustration of not even coming near making the playoffs last year. And I still think that what's going to happen this year is going to be a learning curve for this team. And they really are about another year away because the Phillies have the money. They have everything in place that they need. So... We're going to see how it goes, but at the end of the day, though, I truly do feel like the Phillies stay under 30 wins this year, and I think that they're a good 27-28 win team this year, to be honest with you, okay? So there it is, under 30 wins, and you guys, we got the receipts right here with the show and everything, so you already know it will be recorded. You guys can run it back, and you guys can see if it's a win, if it's going to be a winner, winner, chicken dinner, or will it not be, but... We'll see how it goes, but under 30 wins for the Phillies this year. We'll see how it goes. And the reigning World Series champions themselves, the Washington Nationals. The Washington Nationals 
uh, once again, I feel like they're going to get off to a slow start this year. And this is going to wind up being something that's going to be detrimental to their health as well, too. And I think that all in all, though, this is going to wind up being something that's going to work out in the top team's favor. And I think that the Nationals are going to have a dramatic fall off because losing Bryce Harper was big, but it wasn't as big because Rendon made up for what Bryce Harper did. You know what I mean? And then Rendon leaves, and he's now in Anaheim with the Angels. So the fall off point is now. You know, they they have a great young young crew of players. And then they have some good savvy vets there as well, too. But it's just not going to be enough for the Nationals, I feel, in my opinion. Okay, I feel like, honestly, what's going to happen here is that the Nationals are going to have a slow start to the season. And since they don't have an extra 80 games like they did last year when they made their push to get into the playoffs, they're not going to have that luxury this year when they get to the halfway point. I think that they'll start picking up the winning at the end of the year, but it's going to be way too late. So that's why I got them under 32 wins uh, for the season for the Washington Nationals, the defending world champions, okay? So... All in all, this is the first episode of the Primetime Angles Live. I didn't want to take up too much time. In a moment, I'm going to be interviewing Burlett Brooks as well, too. And that's going to be for uh, Fanatics View. So you guys be on the lookout for that one. We will be live with that interview as well, too. So you guys be uh, on the lookout. But this is going to be the Primetime Angles on IG Live. And that's going to be a wrap uh, for us today. The show is brought to you by... The show is brought to you by Prime Wave Media Group, LLC. You guys, go ahead and follow uh, the YouTube page as well, too, the, which is the same title, Prime Wave Media Group. So once again, thank you guys very much for tuning in. And this is a wrap for episode number one of the Primetime Angles Live on IG.